So tonight's topic is Sweet Feast of Love Divine, the Lord's Supper in the Brethren Movement. In 1981, a Baptist and an Anglican published, I don't think I'm on here, am I? Yeah, yeah. In 1981, a Baptist and an Anglican published a popular history of the Lord's Supper, or as it is referred to in Anglicanism, the Eucharist. When discussing the Lord's Supper in the Brethren, they wrote, the average member of a Brethren Assembly will scarcely have heard the word sacrament, yet the whole atmosphere is deeply sacramental. To take part in one of these simple services at their best is to be profoundly and movingly aware of the presence of Christ, feeding on him in one's heart by faith and thanksgiving. The principal effect of the Reformation was to exalt the word at the expense of the sacrament. By their example, the brethren were the first to call a halt to this process and to restore the equality of word and sacrament, which is the hallmark of true Christian worship. The Baptist author Don Bridge had belonged to Hebron Hall in Stockton, County Durham, and served for a while at Riverside Evangelical Church in Ayr. So it might be thought as pardonable exaggeration the claim that the emergence of the brethren was of profound significance for the whole of the Western Church. For the first time since the Reformation, a Protestant body came into being in which the Eucharist was central. We might argue over how profound the impact the brethren had in Western Protestantism, but it is certainly true that the brethren pioneers had a special place in contemporary Protestantism in the centrality they gave to the weekly Lord's Supper, though it should be noted they were not unique in their frequency of commemoration. How did this happen? In what follows, I will look at the development of the brethren mode of holding the Lord's Supper, or the breaking of bread, before turning to a number of controversies that emerged, and then to the theology of the occasion, before finally taking off my historian's hat, sticking my neck out, and hopefully not putting my foot in it, by making some deductions from the history of the Lord's Supper in the brethren movement, and asking some questions about its present form. So I'm going to look at development first, and then some debates, and then some doctrine, and then finally some deductions. Well, without alliteration, would it be really a talk about the brethren? <laughs> we can place quite precisely when and where the service began that is recognizable as a brethren form of Lord's Supper. This is due to an account of the early movement by John Gifford Bellet, a barrister who was one of the pioneers. The three small groups which had been meeting in Dublin for the breaking of bread had coalesced into one in middle-class domestic rooms in Fitzwilliam Square. In 1830, they decided to move to a rented room above a cabinet maker's shop in the lower social class, Anger Street. Now, I know to you and me that might look like Anger Street, but I'm assured in Dublin that's not how to pronounce it. Bellet wrote, the settled order of worship that we had in Fitzwilliam Square gave place gradually. Teaching and exhorting were first made common duties and services, while prayer was restricted under the care of two or three who were regarded as elders. But gradually all this yielded. In a little time, no appointed or recognized eldership was understood to be in the midst of us, and all service was of a free character. The presence of God through the Spirit being more simply believed and used. In the summer of that same year, 1830, George Muller, who at the time was the pastor of Ebenezer Chapel in Tainmouth in Devon, found it scriptural, according to the example of the apostles, to break bread every Lord's Day, and that there should be given room for the Holy Ghost to work through any of the brethren whom he pleased to use. Also in 1830, an ascent assembly came into existence in Devon at Plymouth. B.W. Newton, who became its most influential leader, stated that initially the Lord's Supper was on Monday mornings with some clergymen attending when also subjects were discussed. But in 1831, due to an initiative of George Vichimius Wigram, a wealthy graduate of Trinity College, Dublin, the Lord's Supper was held in Providence Chapel on a Sunday initially in the vestry, but later in the chapel itself, where, Newton wrote, I was to sit at the head of the table, 
Is that coming? Yes, yeah, that's coming up prematurely, but it won't matter. I was to sit at the head of the table and rule, and anyone was allowed to speak who thought fit to do so. And if he did not speak to edification, I was to silence him. Newton also claimed that this was the pattern he adopted when he was at the first Brethren meeting in London in 1833 or 4, held in a house in Regent Square. Newton used this authority on occasion at Plymouth, and his control there was to be one of the sources of the major split that divided the Brethren into exclusive and open sections. How these early ad adoptions of spontaneous worship at a weekly Lord's Supper had developed a decade later in 1840 can be seen from the earliest extant description by a witness to brethren practice. It occurs in recollections published privately in a small pamphlet by Anne Evans, who had been a worker in the orphan houses in Bristol with Muller when he had moved there when he was joint pastor at Bethesda Bristol with Henry Craig. In it, Evans describes her first experience of the worship of Bethesda Chapel. She had been a Baptist in London and had worshipped there in a well-appointed chapel. Her first impression of Bethesda Chapel was of its plainness and the grotesque ugliness of the woman's dress. She writes, the service began by someone reading the notices, then a pause. Soon her brother rose and prayed. Now we were at once taken up into the presence of God. It was real spirit-led prayer, and I forgot the dress and everything else. Another pause, and then a hymn, sung like a funeral dirge, with closed eyes and all sitting, very badly sung too. Another prayer, and then the bread and wine were passed round. Pause again, and then prayer. Now Mr. Craig stood up to speak. His exposition of scripture was quite a new feature of worship to me. The meaning of the passage read was brought out as I'd never heard it before. There was more speaking in prayer, and then a benediction. I shall come again, I said. And I did go again and again, and never went anywhere else while in Bristol. Initially, the hymns used at the weekly commemoration of the Lord's Supper were drawn from the general store of Christian hymns produced by the 18th century evangelical revival. One early compilation, a selection of hymns, was published anonymously in 1839 by Sir Edward Denny, a wealthy Irish landowner who'd been attracted to the Brethren in the early 1830s. Wigram, in 1840, published the first of several editions of hymns for the poor of the flock. The first hymn book designed for ease of use at a Brethren's Lord's Supper was a Christian hymn book, published in Exmouth and Devon in 1847. It contains a dedicated section entitled At the Lord's Table, consisting of 13 hymns, as well as a larger one for meditative praise, for which singers were advised to remain seated, the custom that Anne Evans had witnessed at Bethesda Chapel. Including in the Lord's Table section were two hymns by a Brethren member, Mary Bowley, soon to marry J.W. Peters, and another early Brethren hymn writer, J.G. Deck, is included in the section headed Worship. The Lord's Supper would be a frequent subject for other Brethren hymn writers, and Mary Peters was joined by other women writers who, by this route at least, made their voice heard at it. In Scotland, the earliest description of the Lord's Supper in the emerging Brethren movement comes much later, in 1859. It was after 1859, really, that the Brethren began to be formed in Scotland. It occurs in the publications of John Bowes, a former primitive Methodist, who had come in contact with the Brethren in southwest England. Bowes was, for a long, long while, the sole Brethren evangelist in Scotland. If he was challenged, if he, was, if he was brethren, he would always deny it, which of course is a very brethren thing. <laughs> he wrote of his assembly in Lochy and Angus, we meet to remember the Lord in the breaking of bread, three or four, generally speak. This seems to be a pattern derived from an earlier tradition of Christian primitivism in Scotland, which was descended from John Glass, 
a deposed Church of Scotland minister who in 1730 had instituted lay leadership and weekly communion in Dundee. As a small body of former Congregationalists in Humanes and Lanarkshire moved towards Brethren practices in 1847, they described their conviction about liberty, liberty of ministry in a glassite phrase, the church should edify itself. And at their first meeting, one of them presided, a practice of the glassite-influenced Scotch Baptists. Glassite influences had been at work in Ireland too, the thinking of John Glass and mutual exhortation might have reached the emerging Brethren movement there through Thomas Kelly or John Walker, who had founded congregations in Ireland in the early 19th century that were, and that were influenced by Glass's views transmitted via the missions of the Haldane brothers, Scottish evangelists of the 18th century. Stirling University is built at present on their former um, estate. A direct influence in Ireland has been impossible to prove, and Donald Akinson is undoubtedly correct in stating that their beliefs and practices, though not directly leading to the Brethren, anticipated in various ways later Brethren practice. In those bodies in Scotland moving towards Brethren practices, the Glassite form of worship was quickly overwhelmed by the rising tide of the movement. In 1873, the first breaking of bread was held at Inch in Aberdeenshire, which was one of the Northeast Assemblies formed in the early 1870s by the movement associated with Donald Ross. At it, there was a series of scripture readings with a prayer of thanksgiving at the dispensing of each element, followed by a hymn and an exhortation, a glassite pattern. You'll pick up that slightly different from the brethren, although it's spontaneous, it's much more... Um, sort of, it, 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 there's, there's fewer prayers and there's much more exhortation and the whole thing's done in a much more kind of 18th century manner in a kind of ordered way, not the kind of um, emo emotionally warm way that we associate with a lot of brethren worship. But by the following year, 1874, the service inch consisted of alternating prayers and hymns, a pattern also witnessed by a contemporary visitor to another unnamed Northeast Assembly. So in other words, what we would recognize as a Brethren practice, pattern had taken over. It's been suggested by the Brethren historian Timothy Stunt that the influx of evangelical Quakers into Brethren life in the 1840s and the aftermath among, the, uh, of, among them um, of the Beaconite controversy of 1834 to six possibly reinforced the impulse towards liberty of ministry and spontaneous worship, the Quaker pattern. You can see there in that illustration, a contemporary illustration, that the, everybody's just sitting around and people can stand up. The one difference, of course, that you'll all pick up on is the fact that it's a woman who's speaking. The Quakers allowed, um, were very early uh, in, in Christian communities of allowing women to take part publicly. Certainly Andrew Borland, an Ayrshire English teacher who was in the mid 20th century editor of the Believers magazine, commented on the similarity between the breaking of bread and the Quaker use of silence. Tim Grass, who's written the standard history of the Brethren movement, has noted that the move to an impulsive ministry predated the influx of Quakers, who are more likely to be reacting against their background. So this is an argument among historians that I'm afraid nobody will ever settle um, until the second coming. Undoubtedly, they would find, the Quakers would find aspects of of breaking of bread familiar. For example, the hymn book that the pharmacologist and former Quaker John Eliot Howard published in 1853 had 24 hymns in the section entitled Meditation. And if you're interested in finding anything more about them, I'll have advertising break. There's a biography of them in the bookstall. A further powerful factor in the reinforcing of um, the spontaneity and spirit-led nature of the supper was mid-Victorian revivalism, which was itself shaped by Brethren influence. It was the dominant context out of which the Brethren grew numerically, the open Brethren grew numerically, and the exclusives too joined an accession of new members. The stress on hymn singing and extemporary prayers and preaching in contemporary revivalism were suited to impulsive views of the spirit, and the emphasis on the atoning death of Christ had significant continuities 
with the brethren commemoration of the Lord's Supper. For the, it probably accounts for the sense of recognition that several contemporary observers felt on witnessing the breaking of bread. The early publications of the Brethren movement are surprisingly silent on a theology of the Lord's Supper. Of the elements that went into its making, the earliest Brethren journal, The Christian Witness, emphasized liberty of ministry. As its first article, it, it printed, I'm getting funny things happen here with this, but never mind, let's press on. Well, there we go. As its first article, it printed J.L. Harris's On Christian Ministry, which criticized a professional caste of clergy and advised the readers to throw themselves on the teaching of the Spirit. From the mid-century, exclusive brethren writers such as William Kelly and C.H. McIntosh wrote in the Lord's Supper, though interestingly, J.N. Darby, the indisputable leader among the 19th century exclusives, wrote nothing systematic on it. Their writings on the breaking of bread undoubtedly influenced the open brethren, and certainly their Christology and interpretation of biblical topology affected open brethren worship. In the open brethren, writing in the Lord's Supper suddenly flourished in the late 19th century as the movement was swollen by the untutored converts of Victorian revivalism. The magazines of the period, particularly the principal open brethren journal, The Witness, under the editorship of the Glasgow soap manufacturer, J.R. Caldwell, repeatedly carried articles, letters, and answers to questions on the breaking of bread. This outpouring continued well into the 20th century, probably reaching its climax in 1950 to 51, when a long running series of articles on the Lord's Supper appeared in the Believer's Magazine, written by Andrew Borland. The liturgical pattern that Anne Evans had, wished, had witnessed at Bristol. I'm using liturgy here in a very loose sense just for an order followed at Christian worship. I'm not meaning like a set pattern of prayers um, that people are following. The, the liturgical pattern Anne Evans had witnessed at Bristol continued as the established form. But there was disquiet in the late 19th century among open brethren leaders that the purpose of the service was being ignored. A number of practical manuals Cheap pamphlets at first, but later books um, were published, which covered everything from the purpose of the supper to basic practical advice, such as arrive punctually and speak clearly and loudly. The writings of this period reinforced brethren doctrine derived from scripture on the breaking of bread and determined what was proper to it. In 1892, G.F. Trench, another Irish brethren landowner, complained in an article in The Witness about the intrusion of extraneous matters, hymns and Christian experience, reflections on the privileges of Christian faith and prayer for the spread of the gospel. He wrote, Scripture, our Lord's own words, fixes the direction the Spirit leads the worship of the church. Caldwell agreed and complained of the routinization of the worship, describing his not infrequent experience as being that the first hour is taken up, come on, there we go, the first hour is taken up with a hymn and a prayer, a hymn and a prayer. The prayers containing little of the element of worship I mean largely repetition of the same request over and over. The aim of the writing in this period was to streamline contributions at the Lord's Supper according to an accepted theology of the ordinance. We'll come to that later. As opinion formers, these writers created uniformity of practice through a single-minded concentration on the central purposes of the Lord's Supper. The opening hymn now was thought to set a theme which at once concentrates our thoughts. A more intellectually and spiritually focused service was the result, but also a more rigid pattern had been enforced. And so we turn, as we always must, come on, please, debates. I must say, seeing all these 19th century brethren figures doesn't make me feel so, quite so alone with having a beard. The intense reflections on the Lord's Supper of the later 19th and early 20th centuries inevitably led to several controversies over it in the open brethren. During the 1880s, come on, this doesn't seem to be going, oh, I'm even pressing the wrong place, there we go. Um, during the 1880s, a group which had as its focus the magazine Needed Truth among other new thinking and practices, prescribed certain ritual actions during the breaking of bread. F.A. Banks, 
the seminal teacher of the new ideas, maintained that the brother who says in the assembly, let us give thanks, I'm problems with this coming up, there we go, Frederick Arthur Banks, there he is, needy truth, um, the brother who says in the assembly, let us give thanks, ere he breaks the loaf, loses his individuality, and is for the time being the mouthpiece of the church. He should then publicly break the bread as a corporate act. Such prescriptions about the morning meeting led to controversy in many assemblies, and eventually their advocates seceded in 1892-4 to, to form what became the Churches of God, popularly called the Needy Truth, which have the most precise liturgical order for the Lord's Supper of any group associated with the brethren. Other patterns of service were promoted by those who remained open brethren, especially in the interwar period of the 20th century. Developing ideas by exclusive brethren writers who read the Old Testament typologically, some open brethren taught that during the morning meeting, there should be a progression through the typological significances of the Levitical sacrifices. Come on, there we go. The sin, peace, meat, and burnt offerings. Others favored concentrating in either the meat offering, interpreted as a type of Christ's perfect humanity, or concentrating only in the burnt offering, thought to signify Christ's devotedness in death to God. During this period, the open brethren individual who developed the most exact liturgy of the occasion was the Scottish evangelist Isaac Ewing. It's not one to come up. There we go who had a, had a wide influence throughout the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. The worshippers were sympathetically retracing the life of Christ to the cross, and the morning meeting was to follow this progress, which was reflected in the hymn book Ewan produced in 1935, Remembrance Hymns. The crucial moment of the service was when the brother who gave thanks for the emblems walked to the table on which they were placed and broke the bread and poured out the wine, thus showing forth the Lord's death. His formulations led to accusations of ritualism. There were other minor debates of the period. One recurring one was whether the bread should be unleavened and the wine unfermented. Rather contradictorily, the majority opinion was in favour of leavened bread but fermented wine. Questions were raised over whether there should be only one loaf and whether it might be broken first and the wine decanted or poured out. Some felt that the loaf should be passed round unbroken with each breaking bread individually, thus showing personal participation in Christ. More than one cup was also resisted as it seemed to erode the symbolism of the participant's unity. But others argued larger assemblies needed to use two or more plates and cups to expedite the distribution of the elements. And moreover, rules should not be established. In one Fife fishing village, the bread was passed from hand to hand, as putting it in a plate would be a symbol of Egypt. <laughs> Mainstream opinion tended to be less doctrinaire and more pragmatic, as in open bread and fashion, within limits, some variety in practice was allowed. However, a line was drawn by Henry Pickering. This is not, oh, this is not one to, to go. Um, Okay, using individual cups in case the Romish practice of using wafers was also introduced. Harry Lacey, and I think I'm going to have to stop and start doing it like this. Right, there we go. You want to have a shot to see if you can get that to. We had problems with it before we began, so it's obviously not been, um, it's not going to cooperate. Harry Lacey, an evangelist from Cardiff, made his feelings clear about these prescriptions in 1950 in an article in the, pre in the magazine Precious Seed entitled Legality in the Lord's Supper. We might be tempted to smile at some of the minutiae of these debates, but like all symbolic actions and intellectual schemes, they sought to increase at the Lord's Supper its emotional heft and sense of the sacred. True to their Christian primitivism, most brethren rejected these elaboration. In the words of Henry Pickering, he wanted to keep the supper sweetly simple, yet gloriously solemn in the presence of the Lord Jesus. The principal issue to agitate the movement over the order of the service, if the number of occurrences and questions the witnesses take as an index, was central to its nature. This was the permissibility of ministry or Bible teaching, 
at the Lord's Supper. Worship was defined as being active, whereas ministry or Bible teaching was received passively. Applying this logic rigorously, a number disapproved of devotional homilies or even scriptural readings at the breaking of bread. However, the consistent advice from the witness from the late 19th to the mid 20th centuries was that they should be permitted since precise rules should not be laid down. Given the cogency of Henry Craik's exposition at Bristol in 1840, it seems likely he had come prepared to preach something the church order at Bethesda in Bristol promoted. Later, in many assemblies, substantial time after the breaking of bread was set aside for more general ministry. But it was advised any ministry given before participation in the supper should lead to the remembrance of Christ. That the New Testament did not provide regulations was recognized. Even holding it weekly, it was admitted, could not be shown from Scripture. Resisting laying down any precise rules also remained true to the original principle at Angier Street, which had seen the presence of God through the Spirit being more simply believed and used. Rules would overrule the Spirit. The most contentious issue of all surrounding the Lord's Supper in the Open Brethren, so this is not to do with order, but it's just an issue surrounding the Lord's Supper, became the question of who should participate in it. In 1834, J.N. Darby, oh, it's gone down too far now. Is that working from there? Yeah, okay. Do you want me to take it again? I think it's working. J.N. Darby had maintained in the Christian witness, yeah, right there, okay. Um, J.N. Darby, here's the quotation coming up, that it is through Christ's death by being lifted up that all men are drawn to him. And so, argued Darby, the Lord's death is the center of communion and the outward symbol and instrument of unity is, is the partaking of the Lord's Supper. Here then are found the character and unity of the church, that into which it is called, that in which the truth of its existence subsists, and in which alone is true unity. It is in showing forth the Lord's death. So he's working out series of logical steps to prove that the Lord's Supper is where the unity of the church is expressed. And Tim Grass has recently described this as the movement's Eucharistic ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is a fancy word for church order. At the Lord's table, the pioneers of the movement had attempted to realize the universal unity of all tree believers, which is the church. As Mary Peters, in their early communion hymn, in a Christian hymn book, wrote, Here everyone that loves thy name our willing hearts embrace. Even after the schism that split the movement into two sections, both divisions continued to hold to this position. Darby, writing from Jamaica in 1869, so well after the split, 20 years after it, maintained that excluding from the Lord's Supper a godly Christian who was in an ecclesiastical system, a Christian denomination, meant that the degree of light is titled to communion and the unity of the body is denied by the assembly, which refuses him. The same principle had earlier been given currency in the Open Brethren by its use in a letter of 1836, written to Darby himself by Anthony Norris Groves, in which Groves was critical of those that were making light not life, the measure of commun communion. Life in Christ, in the universal church which is his body, not an understanding of ecclesiology or church practice, or light, made it imperative to welcome all true believers to the Lord's table. Excluded from participation at the Lord's table, uh, the Lord's Supper, however it was agreed, were those judged to hold erroneous doctrine or guilty of moral failings. Also universally accepted was it was for believers only. That Judas had left the Last Supper before Christ broke bread was a commonplace of brethren biblical interpretation. For Caldwell, the separation was emphasized by the division of the Sunday services into a morning meeting for Christians and an evening one for unbelievers. In some quarters from the mid-1870s, as part of what William Shaw the editor of the Believer's Treasury, described as a steady tightening process, being an evangelical Christian was no longer enough to ensure reception to the Lord's table. Three redefinitions took place. First, the relationship of an assembly to denominational churches 
was redefined. Only in the assembly was the lordship of Christ acknowledged. And therefore, being in rebellion against Christ, members of denominational churches should be excluded from the Lord's Supper. Second, the relation of the local church to the universal church was also redefined as being in separate circles, membership of the universal one not automatically qualifying for membership of the inner circle, the local church, which entailed a separate act of receiving. And thirdly, the Lord's Supper was also reassigned a new place. The breaking of bread was demoted from its unique place to being only one activity of an assembly. There could be no occasional fellowship of the Lord's Supper without accepting responsibility for all the activities of the local church. The novel views were promoted by those who had founded the magazine Needed Truth, and a sizable proportion of those who drank in its teaching succeeded to form the churches of God, now still called the Needed Truth. The new ideas continued to influence other open brethren who did not secede, and in the Edwardian period, controversy over them flared up again in a pamphlet war. It was particularly warm in Scotland, with its two open brethren publishing houses taking up opposite positions. John Ritchie, whose publishing house is still in Kilmarnock, favoured the more stringent qualifications for reception and published several writers who advocated it, including himself and others such as F.A. Banks and W.H. Hunter. The more open view was represented by those writers published by Henry Pickering. Um, Henry Pickering's shop is now the Faith Mission shop in Bothwell Street, but it's still, to those of a certain age, P and I's, Pickering and Ingalls. Um, Pickering, Pickering published people such as G.R. Caldwell, Alexander Marshall, and Alexander Stewart. In 1877, it was Stewart, a Glasgow solicitor, who in a letter to Marshall, restated the Groves' position in a memorable phrase. Fellowship, by which he meant reception to the Lord's table, is the birthright privilege of all saints. So in other words, if you're a Christian, you should be received. It's your birthright privilege. The controversy was not confined to Scotland. It opened a deep fissure worldwide in the open brethren by its spreading to the British dominions, the USA, and eventually the missionary movement. In those arguing for exclusion, the early Eucharistic ecclesiology had been replaced by a more institutionalized body with a formally recognized membership. Remember the letters of commendation? The primary act of fellowship in the brethren was receiving an individual to the, to the breaking of bread. It was indicative of the place that the Lord's Supper had in the brethren movement that this whole controversy over a restricted fellowship should focus on this act. Tellingly, the often bitter debates were known as the reception question. And so, finally, we come to doctrine. Ironically, as Henry Groves, a son of Anthony Norris Groves, pointed out, what had been a symbol of unity had become a source of disunity. It was one of the surprises of the earliest Brethren publications that beyond the emphasis on unity, little else was written on the theology of the Lord's Supper. That's not to denigrate the unity point because it's a key one for the Brethren. The earliest extensive writing in the breaking of bread among open Brethren is that by John Eliot Howard shortly after he left the Quakers to form an assembly in Tottingham in 1838, which he published in the Enquirer, the journal he had founded and edited. For Howard, the Lord's Supper was the rallying point of the saints on earth, and perhaps surprisingly, unsurprisingly for former Quaker, he rejected a sacramentalist understanding of the occasion, but held to a low church memorialist view. The Quakers, of course, don't have any... Um, ordinances or, or sacraments at all. They don't have either the Lord's Supper or baptism or anything else. It was, wrote Howard, originally a supper of pious friends commemorating the death of their Lord till he come. This anti-ritualist, memorialist view of the Lord's Supper was frequently restated in brethren writing, particularly as regards the material elements of bread and wine. Darby, in a letter of 1869 to some French believers who were obviously troubled by the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, that the, the, the bread and wine become the actual body and blood of Christ, 
use the analogy of a portrait of his mother, remaining but a portrait and not becoming his actual mother, for the material elements remaining but bread and wine. That it was in any sense a feast was rejected by many writers, particularly those who followed the scriptural exegesis which had originated in the exclusive brethren, that in 1 Corinthians, the Lord's table of chapter 10 and 21 was not the same as the Lord's supper of chapter 11, verses 17 to 34. The word sacrament, um, usually defined as involving grace received, was never used, and preferred instead was the low church term ordinance, indicative of following a command. Now, as these two terms are going to be key in what I'm going to argue next, um, let me just stop for a minute and let you take in this. The word sacrament has been given a classic definition by Augustine, and he defined it as an outward sign of an inward and visible grace. And in the Protestant Reformation, it was seen as a means of receiving grace. When the term ordinance is used, it's more to do, an ordinance is obviously to do with commands. So it's following a command of a Christ in a practice that demonstrates the participant's faith. So what's the difference there? Well, is it an outward expression of faith, as the ordinance word suggests, or as sacrament suggests, is it an impartation of God's grace? In other words, at the Lord's Supper, are we giving witness to our faith, or are we at the Lord's Supper receiving God's grace? That's the debate. So the memorialist view leans heavily towards the ordinance idea. That's it. It's just a memorial, and we're witnessing to our faith. We're proclaiming the Lord's death. That there were other understandings present in the early movement has its early evidence in a hymn that gives this lecture its title. And I have to admit, this is where you feel um, it's a bit of a fluke because when it was asked for a title, I thought, oh, sweet feast of love divine, that's a good title. But actually I discovered that it's the earliest evidence of the other view that exists. It, it, so the Sir Edward Denny's hymn first appeared anonymously in 1839. So... That's only nine years after the Brethren began to be formed. Um, and probably was written earlier. If you know anything about publication and writing, then he probably wrote it some three or four years earlier. So very shortly after the beginning of the movement. So, but it first appeared in print in 1839 in his hymn book, A Selection of Hymns. But undoubtedly written earlier. The last line of the first verse would suggest Denny too had a purely memorialist view, as the breaking of bread is simply in memory, Lord of thee. But Denny places the concept of a feast prominently the first line and has his guests feeding on the bread and wine. The second verse continues this higher view. Here every welcome guest waits, Lord, from thee to learn the secrets of thy father's breast and all thy grace deserve. Is clearly indicating that there's a reception of grace here. That Christ met with believers at the Lord's Supper, and in doing so they received grace, was a recurring motif in Brethren hymns written for the Lord's Supper. To look no further than the Brethren hymn writers, including the Believer's Hymn Book section entitled in the index, The Lord's Table, another of Denny's hymns prays, Saviour, may we see thee bleeding. Mary Peters um, sorry, David Beatty, thy waiting saints inspire. Mary Peters, thy peace, thy joy impart. And Alexander Stewart, oh, let thy glory fill the place and bless us while we wait on thee. Robert Chapman declares, faith eats the bread of life and drinks the living wine. J.G. Deck, here in the broken bread and wine, we hear thee say, remember me. And George Goodman, in our hearts, his love is shed abroad. So is faith quickened for the conflict here? Miss C.A. Wellesley exclaims, Oh, what joy thy presence gives us. That the believer met with Christ at the breaking of bread was also held by those who wrote more prosaically. Darby, in his letter to the French believers, immediately after denying any material transformation of the bread and wine, maintains there is more than this in the supper of our Lord. Because the Lord is really present with us, in it, spiritually, according to the intention of the institution. We, but that means himself, hinder the materializing of it. And we insist that the spiritual realization 
or that which it represents be in the heart. In the early 20th century, Russell Elliott, a former exclusive who had become open brethren, alluded to Anglican Eucharistic doctrine when he maintained we ought to be believers in the real presence in the true sense of that term. The real presence in Anglicanism was the fact that Christ was actually present in the bread and wine. But he's saying the real presence in the true sense of that term. Christ may not actually be present in the symbols, but he was really present at the supper. At the table, Christ is Lord and believer are his guests, Henry Groves um, held. Henry Groves came close to defining the elements themselves as sacraments when expressing surprise at the existence of any material symbols in the church, which in common with other brethren, he believed belonged to the heavenly dispensation. He noted in divine wisdom, have we got Henry Groves? No, sorry, um, I don't. Um, when expressing surprise at the existence of any material symbols, which in common with other brethren he believed belonged to the heavenly disposition, he noted, in divine wisdom, we are called to give outward expression to that which is realized inwardly and spiritually. The outward is really a test of the inward. So it's very close to Augustine's de definition of it being um, uh, the um, a material sign of an of, of a, a inward um, grace. Close to the notion of the sacrament is the language of Alexander Stewart. He is again. If worshippers drew near, duly self-judged, expecting the spiritual blessing, more sure to faith in the worthy receiving of the supper. Expecting the spiritual blessing, more sure to faith. So in other words, grace is being received. We shall discern the Lord's body. Now I'm not exactly sure what he's saying there. Is he saying that somehow Christ is... Uh, Christ is spiritually present in, in, in it. Others, however, while still expressing a high view of the supper and seeing it as qualitatively different from other experience, shied away from seeing it as being of a class of its own and quali qualitatively different from, other, for, from any other reception of Christ's grace. W.H. Bennett wrote, when assembled at his table, one, he was one of the editors of Echoes of Service, incidentally, if you haven't come across him before, when assembled at his table, we may feed more fully on Christ, yet only in the same sense as that we feed upon him whenever we meditate upon him. So in other words, the Lord's Supper is a magnified version of what the believer's daily practice is. These writers generally accept the Calvinist conception that at the Lord's Supper, faith is awakened for the believer to feed on Christ. As the choice of hymns for the Lord's Table in a Christian hymn book of 1847 shows, this was accepted in the early stages of the movement. Isaac Watts, Jesus invites us now to sit around his board, which was included, instructs a singer, for food he gives his flesh, he bids us drink his blood. The really novel point in the early movement had been the adoption of a non-clerical, impulsive ministry. Later 19th century hymns from the Reformation tradition were also included in Brethren collections, particular favourites being Horatius Bonner's Hear, O Our Lord, We See Thee Face to Face, and C.H. Spurgeon's Amidst This Our Beloved Stands. Given the Brethren pioneers' retention of a Calvinist soteriology, soteriology is a posh word for the doctrine of salvation, this should come as no surprise, but it perhaps explains its omission from early writings on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. The point seems so obvious to everyone that it was taken for granted. Like the absence of instrumental music at the breaking of bread and the justification for its exclusion, the theology had been taken over from English Calvinist descent. The majority in the movement, however, were probably closer to the position of the Swiss reformer Ulrich Zwingli, that it is not the actual partaking of the symbols of his passion, but faith which makes Christ really present. The more central place the, the Lord's Supper had in the Brethren movement, in distinction from dissenting churches in England or in Scotland from Presbyterian ones, came from its weekly celebrations. 
It was not until the movement expanded beyond its original base and there were growing numbers to instruct that Darby and his letters and exclusive and open brethren writers and their publications found it necessary to explain a more comprehensive doctrine of the breaking of bread, which had been there from the early days of the movement. In the end, however, by the mid-20th century, it was a purely memorialist view which won out as the accepted doctrine of the movement, perhaps in reaction to the more ceremonial and ritual elements that had been introduced in the Brethren debates from the mid-1870s until the interwar period of the 20th century, but certainly as a recoil from the, the advance of the trends towards Catholicism in the established churches of England and, we, and Scotland. In North America, it was the purely memorialist view that prevailed, and Brethren historical writing on the Lord's Supper from there has maintained it was the view universally held by the movement. In all periods, the Brethren avoided the word sacrament. It was not used in scripture for one thing, and was associated with church Christianity for most. But the majority, even among of the, the many of those teaching a purely memorialist view, held a sacramental theology of the Lord's Supper. Although the bread and wine remained merely symbols, the breaking of bread was a locus for receiving the inward grace of Christ. So let's revisit that slide. So is it an outward expression of faith or an impartation of God's grace? Actually, what the brethren are saying is that grace is received by being at the Lord's Supper because we meet with Christ personally. We might not meet him in the material elements of bread and wine, but we, he's certainly there, and these symbols um, bring his presence real, make his presence real to us. So it's not just an ordinance, although that was the word that was preferred. There is actually, although they wouldn't actually like to use the word, a sacramental view. And so the, it's the, the idea that's important, not the actual word that we use of it. The exclusive brethren writer William Kelly explained Matthew 18 and 20, where two or three are gathered unto my name, there am I in the midst of them. And those who you really know your Bibles will know why there's a sick there, because it's not unto, it's into my name. Um, he, he, he's doing a brethren gloss on it there. There am I in the midst of them, um, by stating this is his real presence. The text in Matthew was a key one for understanding the breaking of bread. In many assemblies, it also dictated the seating, which in most halls and meeting rooms was unfixed. Placing the table centrally apparently goes back to the seating arrangements in the 1820s, when the breaking of bread was still held in private rooms. Bellet states that the move to the rented room had to be let the Lord's table in the midst of us become somewhat more of a witness. Given the literalistic scriptural hermeneutic of the brethren and the allusion to Matthew 18 and 20 in the midst, the reasonable interpretation of Bellot's phrasing is a literal reading, suggesting that the table was in the middle of the worshippers, first in Fitzwilliam Square and then in Anger Street. Certainly, the earliest of the purpose-built chapels in England placed the table prominently. At Ebrington Street Chapel opened in Plymouth in 1840, the large table, and I quote, was placed at the centre. You can see it there just at the bottom of the image there in that kind of wee um, diagram. The large table was placed at the centre as the most prominent object around which were raised the seats in a gentle rise from the floor so that everyone could look on it. A similar conspicuous place at the table was also evident at Providence Chapel, the early one in Exeter. As part of the greater stress on the symbolism of the occasion in the interwar period of the 20th century, it would seem that a number of assemblies moved to adopt as a preferred seating plan of the breaking of bread a square with a table carrying the elements in the middle. In 1927, for example, we find S.R. Hopkins arguing in the witness that if it were convenient, the table should be in the middle of the hall, suggesting the Lord himself is the central object before us. A literal reading of Matthew 18 and 20, Christ in the midst, dictated both the central purpose of the breaking of bread and its spatial arrangement. It's also a seating plan that is not focused on one individual. At a common sense level, it's easier to see and hear a speaker when the congregation is facing each other in a square, but it's also an arrangement that suggests the involvement in common status of the worshippers. For the brethren, 
the spontaneous, impulsive pattern of worship in the early church at Corinth, as described in 1 Corinthians 14, was normative for their practice at the Lord's Supper, although speaking in tongues and prophesying were thought to have ceased. The breaking of bread was the open meeting par excellence. If there were a president, then it was the Lord himself who presided. If the worship were directed, then it was the Holy Spirit as guide and sovereign distributor of gifts who was leading as he moved in the hearts of those present, using them as fit mouthpieces to express the assembly's worship. This would be achieved, Council John Ritchie, by the spiritual discerning the Spirit's leading. First, by an inward desire and conviction, that w- which would then lead to a hymn or thanksgiving, which should be done as in the presence of the Lord, so that the Spirit should not be quenched. True worship was spontaneous. There were a number of areas of faith that were excluded. There was to be no consideration of need for forgiveness or any other Christian blessing or sharing of life experiences. Concentration and subjective experience ousted Christ from his place. Confession of sin should take place as part of self-examining before the supper. Even the exposition of Christian doctrine was seen to be out of place. And it was this that led many to question whether there should be any ministry at all at the Lord's Supper. Ministry had its place, noted William Kelly, but everything for the time gives place to Christ and his death, and this occasion is the Lord's Supper. In characteristically dramatic prose, Ritchie set out the purpose of the Lord's Supper, which would exclude these other areas of Christian life. The special object for which the Lord assembles these people, thus he wrote, is to remember him in the breaking of bread. Rich's allusion as to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 to 25, another key passage for shaping brethren understanding. The Lord's Supper proclaimed the Lord's death, which was the essential focus for worship. For Darby, it was a dead Christ he came to remember. David Kirk, a Canadian evangelist who came from Belfast, saw the elements in the ordinance as establishing the parameters of the Lord's Supper, the corn of wheat, which gives us our bread falling into the ground to die, was a precious emblem of the death of our Lord Jesus. The rich ruby wine obtained through the pressing of the grape, he's getting a bit poetic here, graphically describes the story of the cross. Others, such as Australian doctor Roland Edwards, wanted to move to a further level of abstraction, to appreciation and occupation with Christ himself. Just as the foundation for the gospel, of the gospel for the brethren as evangelicals was the cross of Christ, so too the primary focus of the Lord's Supper was the death of Christ. David Bebbington in his history of evangelicalism cites the lament of Anne Arnott, whose family in the interwar period worshipped in Manvers Hall in Bath, that even in Christmas Day the brethren were focused on the crucifixion. The centrality of Christ's death to the worship meant that the tone of of the breaking of bread was somber. Brethren writers warned of light-hearted flippancy. Walter Scott, a native of Hamilton and a former exclusive, was entirely typical in maintaining that much loud and joyous singing is surely out of place in partaking of the memorials to his dying love. A holy, chastened, reverent spirit is especially becoming when assembled to eat the Lord's Supper. A marked shift in tone took place at the end, however, for the Lord's Supper was held, as the frequently quoted scripture stated, until he come. It might look backwards, but it also looked forward, as Henry Pickering noticed. And so it often ended in a more upbeat hope. It was a leisurely service, which it was advised could be anything from two hours in length to one and a quarter. As Anne Evans had found at Bethesda Chapel in 1840, there would be silences. A later member of Bethesda, Arthur Rendell Short, a professor of surgery, felt everyone, including those who sat in quietness, might profitably use the silences. It is there to occupy each pause, not in wondering who will take part next, but in responding to the gracious invitation of the Spirit as he calls through him or scripture or the word ministered, to draw near to Calvary. Harry Lacey from Cardiff did not want pauses to be long and criticised barren silences. On the other hand, 
Caldwell wanted an even more leisurely service in which the participation of the Lord's Supper reasonably close to the start so it could be lingered over in blessed meditation. Isaac Ewan wanted it near the end, moving towards it softly, reverently, meditatively. A number of early accounts of the breaking of bread services, such as that of Ari Evans, bear testimony to the awareness of the numinous that those present sensed. It was also a sphere in which men could openly display emotion and reports of tears at the Lord's Supper was evidence of deep devotion. Henry Pickering clearly felt for many when he asked, who is it, who that has upon the Lord's day partaken of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of the Lord's death and in hope of the Lord's coming has not experienced in a peculiar sense what it is to have days of heaven upon earth. Another Brethren publisher, Howard Muddit, was wary of the reform concept of a means of grace when used of the Lord's Supper, as it might imply some automatic benefit from participating. This was because he accepted worship was active. The believer gave rather than received. A Christian hymn book had advised the singer to sit for hymns of edification and meditation as it symbolized repose, but to stand for hymns of worship when the act of energy of faith and of spiritual intelligence is or should be in exercise, apprehending and responding to the excellencies of God. Nevertheless, Madak clearly saw the breaking of bread as giving an uncovenanted blessing, spiritual renewal in life and service. The Lord's Supper was regarded as the most significant moment of the week, the highest form of fellowship with God and his people, to which the believers called Upon earth, John Ritchie wrote. It was a service above all others at which attendance was obligatory. The need for careful preparation of soul was stressed. Because of the worshippers depending on the promptings of the Spirit, it was important that the individual's life was also kept open to his influence. For one writer, a daily feeding of upon Christ must necessarily precede it, enabling us to remember him in an earthly manner on the first day of the week, as we gather to participate of his supper. For the New Zealand businessman, Robert Laidlaw, it was a tremendous challenge to individual holiness, for we, uh, we draw near as priests. Andrew Borland held the commemorative view of the breaking of bread, but he thought it was not only that. He held a concept of victorious Christian life, and he saw the supper as being a most solemn protestation of faith, and a redemptive work which claims in return for the benefits accruing therefrom the complete surrender of the redeemed life. Caldwell concurred. The supper will separate us from the world and its ways and bind us together in divine love and unity and give us victory over sin and Satan, he wrote. Regarded as a crucial means by which spirituality was advanced, it became to borrow a phrase from the Salvation Army, the holiness meeting of the movement, the core of the members' devotion. And so finally, we come to some deductions. Actually, they're not really deductions, they're questions more, but um, you know, there's always one point in a scheme of alliteration where it doesn't quite work. So they're, um, but they are kind of deductions. So this is where, um, <coughs> stop being historical, that's the historical bit over really, um, although there are one or two bits of history about to crop up. And what I want to do is um, ask some questions about what all this means for our present practice. And I'm not going to give you any answers. I'm just going to ask questions at this point. So four questions. One, can we change anything? The American Brethren theologian Rex Coivisto has written, quite frankly, weekly celebration of the Lord's Supper tremendously enhances my understanding of the significance of the atoning work of Christ. He goes on to note how the reflective and participatory worship means it becomes easily owned by the people, and being lay-led, it provokes a more general desire to study out the scriptures for oneself, since the congregation does not expect another to feed them. But Coivisto makes this positive appraisal in a book by him in which he's trying to distinguish what he calls an interpretative tradition of Christian denominations from what he calls core orthodoxy. The brethren manner of commemorating the Lord's Supper 
belongs within a particular Christian community's interpretative tradition. It is an accepted way of reading scripture, which is not necessarily supported by the text itself. It is in this context he cites it as an example. As we have seen, brethren leaders in the past knew they could not substantiate from scripture all that they did at the breaking of bread. And it could be argued, indeed, in 1 Corinthians 14, they ignored some of the things that um, are, are there in the Corinthian worship. It's clear now that cultural factors, for instance, all that influence in silent, as the interpretative tradition were at work in the shaping of the service. And so I ask, is our way of commemorating the Lord's Supper fixed for all time, or can it be reshaped by our contemporary context in which those in the Brethren movement currently find themselves? And second question, can anything else be admitted? The Canadian Evangelical Presbyterian historian, the late Ian Rennie, in a fascinating paper on brethren spirituality, noted that brethren spirituality appears restricted, cerebral, and serious. It's all to do with the mind, and we've got to be serious. The objective focus of the Lord's Supper required a capacity for abstract thought. Assembly members had to have an ability to engage in silent meditation and doctrine and the text of Scripture, and during public participation, to cite effortlessly from memory biblical passages relevant to the theme of the prayers and hymns. As the Brethren full-time worker John Allen has noted, it produced thoughtful, careful people with a more stringent intellectual approach to faith than those reared in churches whose worship majors in noise and excitement or predictable liturgy. The efforts of the writers and preachers of the late 19th and early to mid 20th century was to narrow the focus of the service in an attempt to achieve a purity of practice that was not in fact possible or possibly even healthy to attain. Even Henry Pickering complained in 1939 of the monotony of alter alternating hymns and prayers. In the Olympic year of 1964, one individual lamented that at the breaking of bread, the young find themselves concentrating and recognizing the theme, seeking to link each hymn, prayer, or meditation together, sometimes by a process of mental gymnastics, little short of Olympic standard. We live in a different culture in which the depth of biblical literacy of earlier generations of brethren, and perhaps the time to develop it, is no longer ours. Are broader themes for worship permissible? And can daily Christian experience also be considered and shared? Third question. Is silence golden? The French cultural historian Alain Corbin has argued that the 19th century was not quieter than ours, as streets echoed to the clatter of horses and carts and the cries of street vendors. What is new now is the incessant flow of words due to permanent connectivity through communication media, which makes us dread silence. He also notes how much silence was a discipline that was learned, particularly in education and religion. And those of you who have been in a school recently will know that that's no longer the case. It's difficult to be silent today, he writes. Society enjoins us to accept noise, to be part of the whole. Are periods of silence worth retaining? They seem inevitable in any service that retains spontaneity, but if so, how do we educate Christians used to the incessant chatter of the present to use them productively? And fourthly, is there nothing sacred? Based on his extensive note-taking at church services, I kid you not, um, David Bevington goes into every church service with a notepad in hand and from the beginning of the service till the end, while taking part in the worship, notes down everything that happens. He's been doing it for about 30 years. And he's noted that one of the drastic changes that's taken place in worship among evangelicals in the late 20th century, uh, late 20th and early 21st centuries, is the use of movement, dance, and gesture. The body, as well as the mind, he wrote, was drawn into the worship experience. The Lord's Supper has already inscribed movement into Christian worship. Breaking bread, 
pouring wine and passing them communally. Within brethren assemblies, physical movement is in weekly use at the Lord's Supper. Bebbington also notes that some of the developments in worship were equally the results of the liturgical movement and of the expressive revolution, by which he means the seemingly contradictory movements in the late 20th century towards more high church expressions of worship and worshippers increasingly expressing themselves in services. Uh, it's interesting to reflect that the contemporary t turn towards the high church elements might partly explain the enthusiasm of bridges and vipers for sacramentalism in the brethren with which I began. The Lord's Supper as practiced in the brethren had both sacramentalism and expressivism. There was sacramentalism in which he was expected to meet with Christ through material signs and receive grace from him. Expressivism was more limited, but there was an expression of emotion, restricted as it might have been. Certainly those assemblies which have introduced changes have moved in the direction of an expressivist sharing of experience. Both, as my questions have been suggesting, might be modified in some ways, but they're emphatically worth retaining as central to our worship. Particularly in England, many brethren background churches already have reverted to the reform position that the preaching of the word is central, or the charismatic Pentecostal one, that emotive performance singing is central. So the band, not the table, is physically the center of attention. So, my final question is really to those of you who have influence in your churches. When last did you hear a sermon on the Lord's Supper? When last did you preach on the Lord's Supper? When last did the church leadership run, say, a workshop on the Lord's Supper, trying to induct your people into the rhythms of the breaking of bread. If we think there is something worth handing on to the next generation, what are we doing to transmit it? Thanks for listening.